bioequivalence criteria between US FDA requirements and the EMA requirements. Welcome dear viewers and the professionals to this very informative and important video and many times these questions are asked in the interviews in the pharmaceutical field. There are some basic differences between the bioequivalence requirement by US FDA and the EMA. Many similarities are also there and some differences are, are also there and we should understand whenever we are making the product for both the markets. Also we should know and understand about the regulatory requirements for the bioequivalence or you can say for demonstration of the bioequivalence. Let's start with some basics which will help you to understand the video in detail. So as we know the bioequivalence criteria is 80 to 125 percent. The bioequivalence can be said to be proved or demonstrated when the two pharmaceutical formulations which may be pharmaceutical alternatives or pharmaceutical equivalents or you can say the reference formulation and the generic formulation or you can also say reference formulation and the test formulation are equivalent when 90% of the CI that is confidence intervals of the ratios of the geometric means of the AUC and Cmax after logarithmic transformation are within the bioequivalence limits of 80 to 125 percent. Simply you can remember like if you consider the AUC and Cmax of reference as 100 then you can have the limit of 20 percent on either side. Now you will have a question that if I consider 100 percent for reference then I will have limit of 80% to 120, 120% but it is not like that because of the logarithmic convergence, the statistical calculations, these limits are given as 80 to 125. I have made a separate video on these limits from where these limits are coming and how these are calculated and given as a limit of 80 to 125 you can visit that video and can have the good idea. So, if the CI, 90% CI of the test formulation or generic formulation is between the 80 to 125% for CMAX and AUC compared to the reference, then the bioequivalence is demonstrated and the bioequivalence criteria is fulfilled. Now, you might have come across the terminology of NTI drugs. These are nothing but the non narrow therapeutic index these are non general type of formulations these are little bit toxic drugs or potent drugs you can say and remember and these drugs are those drugs which if lead to the smaller changes or differences in plasma will show either no effect or toxic effect so narrow therapeutic drugs are the drugs where small differences in the dose or plasma concentration or blood concentration may lead to serious therapeutic failures or serious side effects or adverse reactions and these are life threatening or result in a persistent or significant disability or incapacity. So these are considered as potent and these have the small therapeutic window. That's why these are known as narrow therapeutic window drugs or narrow therapeutic index drugs. These are abbreviated as NTI drugs. The example is warfarin sodium. And some are non narrow therapeutic drugs. So those drugs have wide therapeutic window. And that's why generalized criteria of 80 to 125 percent of CI is given for narrow therapeutic drugs. The AUC and CMAX 90% confidence interval limit is 90 to 111 percent. Now coming to the highly variable drugs. So these drugs are also treated differently 
or on the case by case basis by the EMA and FDA. Highly variable drugs are those which are showing the variation in the plasma profiles or variation in the absorption or metabolism you can say or ADME you can say. Highly variable drugs have been defined as those drugs for which the within subject variability equals to or exceeds 30% of the maximum concentration Cmax and or the area under the concentration versus time curve. So this variability may be for Cmax, AUC or for both or either Cmax or AUC. These are the drugs we show more than 30% or equal to 30% within subject variation. That means if you give these drugs to the same subjects multiple times, there will be variation in the plasma concentrations and this will lead to changes in the CMAX and AUC. So understand the meaning of within subject variability. That means variability is in the same subject only. Now coming to the differences. So parameters we will see then US FDA requirement and the EMA requirement. If the drugs are non-NTI or non-narrow therapeutic drugs, the standard range for 90% CI is T by R ratio is within 80 to 125 percent. This is very much same for the EMA as well. Standard range T by R ratio is 80 to 125 percent. Now coming to the narrow therapeutic index drugs. Here some differences are there. But the T by R ratio is same for USFDA and EMA. It is 90% to 111%. For US, the T by R ratio is 90 to 111% with additional monitoring is required and tighter acceptance criteria, more stringent study designs are required. Now for EMA, T by R ratio is same as per US like 90 to 111%. Justification is required for narrow therapeutic index drugs and specific guidelines and more rigorous testing for NTI drugs is required. So you can see here also some similarities are there like rigorous testing and some standards are stringent for both the USFDA and EMA. Now coming to the highly variable drugs. So for USFDA, variability scaling is allowed, scaled B limits are allowed. That means you can use replicate designs which may be partial replicate or which may be full replicate. But for US, widening of the Cmax limit is not allowed. For US requirement, you cannot widen the Cmax limits. While the widening of Cmax limits is allowed by EMA. So this widening of Cmax is allowed with proper justification. Variability scaling is also allowed as like by the USFDA. Then by EMA, wider Cmax limits are allowed. But in USFDA, Cmax widening is not allowed. We will see the Cmax widening criteria in the next slide. Then extrapolation of the bioequivalence. So for USFDA, limited extrapolation of bioequivalence for different strength or doses form is allowed. And for EMA, extrapolation may be allowed on a case by case basis. Then USFDA and EMA for fasting and fed conditions. So till now, uh, till the ICH guideline came, the USFDA requirement was that the bioequivalent study should be conducted in fasting and fed both. But now the USFDA and EMA has the same guideline as per ICH. It is M13A guideline. You can go through my videos on ICH M13A guideline and you can have good information. So now the uh, for USFDA fasting studies are preferred. Fed studies are required if the reference product shows good effect.
for ema fasting studies are preferred head studies are required if the food effect is observed so now it is streamlined earlier for usfda for the same formulation the fasting and fed was compulsory and for ema fasting was the main uh, preferred study also for both the usfda and ema crossover studies are required and preferred then both ema and uh, usfda prefer healthy subjects in the study if the drug is showing toxicity or drug is having the side effect or if it is required to test the drug only in the patients then patients are required to be enrolled in the bioequivalence study i hope you are getting good information from this slide you can note down these points and you can go through these videos many times or repeatedly so that you will remember all these differences and similarities then widening of the cmax limits so many of the professionals don't understand these limits and how these are derived highly variable drugs as i have mentioned show the within subject variability equal to or more than 30% for the maximum concentration cmax or for the auc the extent of widening is defined based on the within subject variability seen in the bioequivalence study using scaled average bioequivalence so here also replicate design is to be used but you can widen the cmax criteria the geometric mean ratio gmr should be within the conventional acceptance range 80 to 125% the possibility to widen the acceptance criteria based on high intra subject variability does not apply to auc where the acceptance range should be remain within 80 to 125 percent, regardless of the variability. The simple meaning of this information is that you can only widen the Cmax limits, but you cannot widen the AUC limits. AUC limits should be within 80 to 125 percent. It is acceptable to apply either three three period or a four period crossover scheme in the replicate design study. So in replicate study. you can go with partial replicate or you can go with full replicate that means three period is partial replicate four period is full replicate now depending on the in within subject cv percent cv the limits of cmax can be defined so if the within subject variability is 30% you will get the limit of 80 to 125% that means it is normal limit if the percent variability or percent uh, cv goes to 35% then the limit will be 77.23% to 129.48% that means you have widened the criteria from 80% 80 to 125 to 77.23 to 129.48 and now as you widen the criteria the chances of study uh, success increases now if the within subject variability is 40% you will get the limit of 74.62 to 134.02 if it is 45% you will get limit of 72.15% to 138.59% and if the variability is up to 50% then 69.84% to 143.19% so this is the last limit for variability above 50% will be considered as failure so up to 50% they have given the widening and these data will be reviewed on case by case basis so it is not like that if variation is there you can directly widen the cmax limits also there should not be clinical relevance or you you should justify the applicant should justify that though the cmax variation is there but it is not impacting on the clinical outcome or therapeutic outcome of the treatment and that's why you can widen the cmax limit if you prove that the drug is highly variable so this was the information regarding bioequivalence criteria similarities and differences between usfda and the ema
i hope this video will help you to understand the basic understandings and basic idea for the requirements of bike balance thank you for watching the video and let's meet soon with such kind of informative video